Amen. Can we give Jesus some praise today, church? Come on, has it been good to you? Amen. Well, we're so blessed that you're here for our first ever Christmas Eve service. It's actually not our first, it's our third now Christmas Eve service. Uh, because this is, so we had a, we had a, 1, a 1 p.m., a 2.30 p.m., and a 4 p.m., and then I go home and die until next Sunday. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's my schedule. So uh, no, we're so blessed that you're with us uh, for our last uh, service of today. And uh, just blessed that we can all be a part of this. Uh, for the first time guests, of course, we want to welcome you. Uh, you're amongst family today. And then, of course, uh, everyone tuning in on Facebook Live right now and on YouTube. Can we welcome our online audience as well? And so, uh, man, we're so excited about this season. Honestly, Christmas is my favorite time of year. It's my favorite season. It's my favorite time of year for several reasons. Um, when I was younger, it was because of presents. Uh, it, it's actually still kind of because of presents. But, like, when I was younger, it was, like, only because of presents. And you remember the age when you, you, you turned and you, you just, you, there was a year that you just began to love uh, giving presents more than you loved receiving presents. Or, or at least, like, just as much. I still love receiving presents, but like, I, well, you just love to give presents. Today, we're talking about a gift that was ultimately given to us, and it's called Hope in Jesus. The message, uh, the title of my message today is A Thrill of Hope, A Thrill of Hope, and ultimately what we're talking about is this hope that Jesus gives. What does that mean for us? How do we apply this hope to our life? What does this have to do with me? And so uh, I, I'm really excited about this message. Um, I, I would love to share ultimately a hope if you, if you would allow me for the next few moments that could really change your life, that could change your reality, that could change your, your current situation, whatever walk of life you may be from, that absolutely changed mine. And so uh, we want to define this thing called hope. Uh, the, the night that Jesus was born, of course, uh, there was angels there. There were, there were angels. There were angels that they were singing, and, and there was this great light, and they were celebrating, and, and they, were, they were sharing some good news, and they were sharing some news to, to the shepherds. And they were telling some, the shepherds some information, but they opened with this line. They said, uh, do not be afraid. And, and all throughout Scripture, all throughout Scripture as we read, anytime we see Jesus or, or, or God communicating through someone or God communicating to someone, maybe through a, a miraculous sign and, or, and wonder, maybe through a burning bush, maybe through an angel, but, but oftentimes when, when God is communicating, he, he leads with these words, do not be afraid. Or in other words, do not fear. Do not fear. Why? Because, because he's God. This is God we're talking about. He's an infinite being. He's, he's, he's all powerful. He's infinite. He's everywhere, all at the same time. He, and he, and he knows everything. He, he's, he's, he has all knowledge. He's this massive God, and he operates in the world of the intangible. And here we are in the tangible. And so I, I don't know if this ever, ever happened to you where you think about how big God is, and, and you just kind of become anxious. You start to think about how, how big God really is, and, and you, your soul, you just kind of get anxious. Like, ugh, he's just so big. He's so massive. I believe one of the purposes that Jesus was sent was ultimately to speak to that anxiousness, was ultimately to speak to the anxiousness, and that God was sent on a rescue mission for every single one of us, as we're going to discover today. So we're going to be in the book of Luke 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Maybe today you, were, you would define yourself as the person that would be least likely to ever step foot into a church. Maybe it took all the faith you had to bring yourself through the doors. Maybe a friend drug you here, a family member. I know that's true. Some of you I can tell by the look on your face. Like a family member drug you here. Maybe they promised you something, promised you a meal, you know, promised you they were going to cook for you, take you out to eat. They picked you up. They threw a hot pocket at you, said get in the car. And uh, they shouldn't have done that, but you're here now, right? And I believe... Every single person in this room is here for a reason, is here for a purpose, amen, and here by divine, divine appointment. And one of the things we believe here at New Anthem Church is that the, the Spirit of God is present in this room and wants you to leave differently than the way you came in, amen. right? Wants you to leave differently than the way you came in. And so, and so we believe that today as a church. We're going to be reading in the book of Luke 2, uh, and we're going to start in, in a, a verse 8. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me as we go into the Word of God today. That night in a field near Bethlehem, where shepherds, uh, were, uh, there were shepherds watching over their flocks. Everybody say suddenly. suddenly. Come on, say suddenly. suddenly. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them, lighting up the field with the blazing glory of God. And the shepherds were terrified. 
But the angel reassured them, saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, for I have come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard, and it's for everyone everywhere. For today, in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. May God bless the reading of his word today. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you open your word to us today. We wanna, we're going to be reading about hope. We're going to be reading about joy. But would they not just be words in a book, on a screen? Would they become something that would speak to our souls and our hearts? So, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you would help me to be completely out of the way, that your spirit would be speaking and speaking loudly right to our souls. Would we leave here never the same? By the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. Amen. I I don't know about you. Oftentimes, uh, when I think of this picture, the Christmas story, we think of the nativity scene, right? We think of Jesus in a manger. We think of wise men. We think of shepherds and sheep and the the little hut thing that they were in. We think of the star. It was probably cold, but in our scene, right, they weren't like, they weren't shivering. They weren't that cold. There was no electricity, but there was a ton of light. There was a ton of light. And it was a stable, and it was smelly, but no one smelled, right? And, and, and no, one, no one was dirty. No one was, there was no dirt even on the animals. And this is the scene that, that a lot of us have. And, and, and what I want to do is I don't want to throw out that scene. I don't want to throw away uh, that scene. But what I want to do is I want to expound on that, that painting that we might paint in our own minds of this picture of Jesus. I want to expand specifically on our view of Jesus. And I want to view him uh, more than just th- this baby that he was sent in this moment in, in this picture. Because the good news for us is that ultimately Jesus was sent, as it says here in Luke, uh, not just a- as a cute little cuddly baby who was going to grow up and, and, and share some good good morals and tell some good stories and do some cool tricks, but ultimately was sent as a rescuer for us. It was sent as a rescuer for you. Now, this might jostle your heart a bit. You might say, Pastor John, I don't, I don't need to be rescued. I don't need a rescuer right now. The Apostle Paul would argue that. Galatians 1, 4, it says this, We know the meaning of those words because Christ Jesus rescued us from this evil world we're in by offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. God's plan is that we all experience that rescue. In other words, we're all knit together by this common thread that there's all something wrong with us. There's something wrong with all of us. This brokenness and this fractured humanity, our imperfection, our sin, that separates us from a holy God. And so we can be absolutely honest with ourselves this Christmas season. When it comes to talking about Santa's naughty list or nice list, we can all just draw the obvious conclusion that we're all ending up on the naughty list. Amen. Why? Because, because we're imperfect. We do the wrong thing. We lie, we cheat, we steal. Maybe you would say today, I don't lie, I'm not a liar. I, my argument would be this. Um, uh, does anyone lie to you more than you lie to yourself? And so we're not perfect. And this isn't a Debbie Downer message. I would never do that to you on Christmas Eve. This is the greatest news in the universe because here's the good news. Here's the good news. The way that God built this to work, the way that God created this and built this is is every single one of us, Ephesians 2 says, apart from Jesus, we're all dead in our sin. We're all dead in our trespasses. And And so this tension that's created is that unless there's something outside of us, unless there's something outside of our ability, outside of our brains, outside of our wits, outside of our talent, unless there's something outside of us working on our behalf, we're all busted and hopeless in the midst of our sin. Enter Jesus, the rescuer for your soul. Amen? And so there's this necessity that's created, a necessity for a savior, Jesus, the hope of the world. Jesus sent on the greatest rescue mission the world has ever seen. For all of us, for your soul. And so he wants to rescue us. I I want to share a story of when I was rescued, if I might. A few years ago, I was uh, doing some work in L.A. I was actually in Hollywood, and I was doing some work. And the group of people that I was there with, we we had a day off. And so they were like, hey, here's what we're going to do. It's our day off. We're going to the beach, and we are going surfing. And I was like, that sounds awesome. Now, 
I grew up pretty sheltered, so I didn't really know much about the ocean. I'm like, hey, if I can handle the Great Lakes, it's, I'm pretty sure I can handle anything, right? And so I was like, let's go to the ocean. Let's go surfing. It's going to be awesome. And so we're on our way there, and I start getting nervous. I look up. I'm looking up some, some information, and I'm realizing, okay, the ocean's a little bigger than the Great Lakes, and there's, okay, I don't know how this is going to go. I'm on my way there. I'm in the back seat of the van, and I just need to have this full disclosure moment. So I'm like, um, okay, hey, guys, uh, just want to let you know. I don't know if this is going to affect anything. I can't swim. <laughs> Just want to say this. Black people were not created to be in the water, right? <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. Here's all I'm going to say. I have five adopted brothers and sisters, all adopted from different families, different, brother, different moms and dads, all adopted from different families, all black. None of us can swim. Coincidence? I think not. Anyways, so we get to the beach. We get to the beach and we start the surfing lesson. I'm, by the way, when I was on my way there and I said I couldn't swim, uh, my friends, they were like, dude, don't worry. Uh, salt water makes you more buoyant. And, and then and the wetsuit you're using helps you float. You're not going to be able to sink even if you wanted to. And I'm like, that's terrific news. Let's do this. Surf's up. So we get to the beach. We get to the beach. And our instructor starts teaching us how to surf. And he's going through. And, and we're, we're doing it just on the beach sand. And kind of, you know, he's showing us how to, like, paddle out and, and, and how to get up on the board. And he says this. He says, hey, listen, I just want to be real honest with you. I've been teaching for five years. Five years, no one ever in the first day actually gets up and is able to stand on their board the first day. It's too hard. There's too much technique. Uh, and I was like, listen, I've snowboarded. I've skateboarded. This couldn't be that hard. And so what am I thinking? I'm going to be the first one in the history of your career to get up on the board. Your boy is going to get up on the board. And so, and so we go up and, and we start, we start trying. We're actually in the water now. And so I'm like paddling out. And my first three or four attempts, like I couldn't even actually get on the board. Uh, it, was, it was pretty pathetic. And then I don't know what happened. My fourth attempt, I, I, just, I just felt the wave coming, and I, I'm sitting like on my chest on the board, and I pop up on my feet, and your boy is balancing on the board. It was awesome. And I was like, woo, woo we're surfing. And, and I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden, my head is heading towards the water. My board is nowhere to be seen. I come disconnected from my board, and I hit the water, and I go under the water. And that's when I discovered two things. One, salt water does not make you more buoyant. And two, there's these things called undercurrents. And undercurrents are these things that are in the water that try to kill black people that can't swim. And so here I am, and I'm under the water, and I'm like, oh, 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 and I'm just, I'm coming up for air, and then I go back down, because I can't swim, and I'm just trying to doggy paddle, just trying to remember all the stuff that I learned, and uh, that didn't work, and, uh, and so I'm trying to keep my head above water, and then at this point in the story is where um, my instructor had to tell me what happened later, because I blacked out, and so this is the story that he told me what happened. He went out to save me. He went out to rescue me. So he goes, he runs, dives into the water. He goes into the water. He starts going towards me. And I'm just like screaming. I'm flailing. And as he approaches me, he's like, okay, okay, come here, come here, come here. And he, he goes to grab me. And I just start punching him in the face. <laughs> and I'm screaming. I'm just, I'm going to die. And I'm punching him in the face. And they said, he could not get me to stop until he said this. Listen, I cannot help you. I cannot save you until you stop struggling. Until you stop struggling, until you stop flailing, I cannot help you. I cannot save you. And if I can be real honest with you today, church, I believe the God of heaven says the same thing to us. Yeah? I believe the God of heaven, he says the same thing to us. Uh, how many times do we... We try, to, we try to do life on our own. We try to pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps, do things under our own strength and power. We try to do life on our own, go through the trials of life, the tragedies of life, the storms of life. We try to cling to our own energy, rely on our own hopes and our strengths. And, and all the while, there's a Savior that was sent that wants to speak to our life, that wants to speak to our situation, whose role, whose purpose was sent to be a rescuer, to be a deliverer, to fill that empty void that's in your heart and your life. But until we stop struggling, until we, until we stop flailing, until we stop trying to save ourselves, he can't step in and be a rescuer. I don't know what your 2019 perhaps looked like. It's almost over. I don't know what this last year looked like for you. Maybe it was like mine. It was not without its tragedies. It wasn't without its heartache, its pain. 
What happens to many of us is, is life happens, life unfolds, it happens. We don't want to feel that way anymore. We don't want to feel that pain. Some th- certain things happen, and, and it jostles our heart, and it gets us off center, and it gets us off kilter, and, and we don't know what to do. And so we just kind of cling to whatever kind of gives us a sense of control. And all the while, Jesus is wanting us to let go of that thing so he can take control, and he can transform our life, and he can transform the situation. And so he wants to be this rescuer. Why? Why? to give us hope, to give us a thrill of hope that wherever your, the state of your soul is, that your weary soul could rejoice again. Amen? Amen. And so what, what is hope? We said we, we're talking about this, this hope that Jesus wants to bring. If we're going to talk about it, we need to ultimately define what hope is. It's important that we define it correctly because the world defines hope differently than Jesus defines hope, Right? The world defines hope differently because the world, when the world defines hope, the world defines it, it's, it's kind of like you're wishing on something, like wishing on a star. Hey, hey, let's hope for a better 2019. Maybe you've heard people say, maybe, let's, hope for a, let's hope for a better 2020. Hey, hey let, let's hope for a better marriage. Hey, let, let's hope for a good health report. Let's hope for a better health report. And the issue is, uh, it's almost like we're bringing our list to Santa, Right? The, 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 the ultimate problem with this way of thinking is that, that hope by itself for, for, for reconciliation isn't going to mend a broken marriage, right? Hope by itself for health isn't going to heal sickness. Hope by itself for a better paycheck isn't going to bring us into a season where we have a better job. Hope by itself for peace isn't going to take away the guilt of a bad decision that we made. And hope by itself for freedom isn't going to deliver us from the addiction that we may have. And so there's something that is needed outside of ourselves that we can cling to. You see, because God's hope in God's economy, it works differently. It works differently. Because the way God's hope works is we're not, we're, not putting our, we're not hoping for something, like we're wishing for something. We're not, putting, we're not hoping for something. We're placing our hope in someone. We're placing our hope in someone. We're not hoping for. We're not wishing for. We're, we're placing our hope, faith, and trust. We're sliding all of our chips in, placing all of our faith, hope, trust, dreams, everything, and betting it all on Jesus, the hope of the world. And this is good news for us. We're placing it in the Son of God. So it's not in hope in, it's hope for. And that hope is only as strong as what we anchor it to. I would wonder today what what we're anchoring our hope to. Is Is it our abilities? Is it our talents? Is it our relationships? What are we what are we clinging our hope to? Paul says this in Romans 15, 13. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What are you trusting in? What are you clinging to? What are you placing your trust in this Christmas season? Is it your job? Is it your health? Is it your feelings? Is it your emotions? Is it your relationships? Because all of those things, the Bible says, are fleeting and are unsure they wave back and forth like, like the, the waves on an ocean. And so if we're going to place, if we're going to slide all of our chips in and place all of our hope and anchor all of our hope to something, it better not move. And it better be something sure, like the foot of the cross, like placing all of our hope in Jesus. I said this the first couple services, that, that in Jesus... And we need to understand this today, that in Christ, God wasn't sending hope for a better life. Do you get that? In Jesus, God didn't send Jesus to send hope for a better life. The purpose of Jesus was to send hope by sending the giver of life. Right? So we're not just hoping and wishing for a better life, like good vibes, good luck, The purpose of God going through all of the trouble of sending a part of himself here to earth to live a perfect, sinless life and die on a tree for every single one of you 
was to give us hope by sending the giver of life, which is found in Jesus. And so Jesus, he is our peace. He is our hope. He is our joy. And he's with us. I love that name of Jesus. Emmanuel is God with us. He's amongst us. He's a friend. He sticks closer than a brother. Jesus, he's here. He's with us. He's for us. I would, I would define that maybe this way. I was, in, uh, I was in Nashville a year and a half, two years ago. My boss came to me one day and he said, hey, we're going to Nashville. And I was like, okay, why? And he said, we're going to a country music concert. He didn't know me very well. And I said, that sounds awesome. It didn't sound awesome to me. But he's like, we're going to Nashville. So we drove through the night, we went to Nashville. We went to this country music concert. It was like this massive venue. It sat 1,500 people. So we go in and it was just packed with what I can only define as just like a sea of white people, right? Just like the whitest people, like even whiter than my wife. Like just, I mean, yeah, my wife would have looked like a gangster there. They probably would have been scared of her. Like that's how white people, like everyone wearing cowboy boots, cowboy hats. I think someone had a rope. I'm like, is that real? Like this is awesome. Awesome, you know, and, and I'm just going in, I'm like, this is amazing. People are kind of looking at me weird, and I'm like, not even offended, because I'm thinking the same thing there. Like, what am I doing here? You know, and, and I look to my left, I look to my left, and there's this massive, like 6'9, maybe 6'10, and not like skinny 6'9, 6 6'10, 6 like massive Dwayne the Rock Johnson looking like dude, black guy, 6'9, 6 6'10. 6 and I look over, I'm like, that is the largest black man I've ever seen. And honestly, I felt a little bit safer. But anyway, so we go, so we go up, we start listening, we start listening to the music. It's fine. So I, we start listening to the music, and, uh, and the first band gets done. The first band gets done, and, and then uh, they're, they're turning over to get ready for the next band. And, and uh, we're just enjoying the music, and on my left shoulder, I feel these banana-sized fingers. And I look over, and I'm staring at the navel of this giant black guy. And I was like, whoo, and, and he looks down, and he starts to bend down towards me, and my heart just starts racing, and I'm like, I should, I'm going to get eaten. Like, I, got, I should call Cece and tell her I love her. Like, this is the end. And he starts, he leans down, and he says in this super deep voice, which I can't replicate because he was probably on steroids, but he, but he leans down, and he's like, so, uh, <clears throat> looking around, we're a little outnumbered here, so uh, if anything goes down today, I got your back. And we both just died laughing. It's like my favorite story, and honestly, I did feel a little safer after he said that. He was massive, but I, I share that story to say this. This Christmas season, Jesus isn't just a, it wasn't just a prophet, isn't just a baby in a manger, but ultimately Jesus was sent to be a rescuer for you. Jesus was sent to be Emmanuel, God with us, amen? And so... And so what does that mean for us? It means the, 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 the areas of your life that you may struggle, that you may wrestle, you feel like you're out of reach of God's love, you feel like you've become the worst version of yourself, that's the moment, that's the area of life that Jesus finds you. And just like that giant black guy from Nashville, he reaches down his arm, he reaches down his hand, he has his hand on your shoulder, and he's speaking to you and he says, hey, I got your back, it doesn't matter what you go through, I am here because I'm Emmanuel, I am God with us, I am God with us. Amen? And he's been sent, he's been sent as a rescuer for you. And he's been sent on the greatest rescue mission to save your soul. And here's the best part. That he doesn't do it because of your merit. He doesn't do it because of our merit, our righteousness, how, how good we try to be, how good we try to act, when we try to clean ourselves up before we, we come to God. It's not based on that. This is the greatest news for us that the Savior, he wants, and he wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you today. I'm just going to ask for the next few moments. We just bow our heads as we close. I wonder today, if there's anyone here that perhaps that maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus, 
Maybe, maybe you've been in need of more than just a sense of hope. Maybe you need a relationship with Jesus. You've been doing life alone. You've been doing life all by yourself and trying to figure it out, trying to work, trying to hustle, trying to flail, struggling. God gives us the opportunity to embrace this rescuer. You can start a relationship with Jesus and he offers it freely. I always, used to, I always had the idea I needed to clean myself up, get myself right before I came to God until I learned that it's Jesus that does the work in my heart and in my life. And he just says, come. And he says, come just as you are. He says, I wanna walk with you, I want a relationship with you. And so maybe you're here today, and you would say, I wanna follow Jesus with my whole life. I want this Christmas season to mean more than just a Christmas spirit, a Christmas songs, and a manger scene. But I want my life to never be the same, I wanna follow Jesus for the rest of my life. If that's you today, I'm gonna to ask on the count of three that you just lift your hand in the air. The Bible, Jesus says, when you recognize me here on earth, I will recognize you before my Father in heaven. And I truly believe when we respond outwardly for what the Spirit is doing inwardly, it can make it all the more real for you. You'll always remember the moment that you raised your hand, that you, that you chose Jesus, allowed the Holy Spirit to come into your heart, come into your life, do a work in your heart and transform me from the inside out. First John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Second Corinthians says, if anyone chooses to be in Christ, chooses Jesus, they're a new creation. Old things have gone, new things have come. If you wanna be made new today, if you want Jesus to come into your heart and your life, on the count of three, I'm just gonna ask you to lift your hand in the air so we can recognize you. Here we go, one, God loves you so much. Two, three, if that's you, just go ahead and lift your hand, awesome, see that? Yes, see that hand, see that hand, awesome. A whole row of people, fantastic. God sees it, God sees it, God sees it, amazing. Amazing, you can put your hands down. I'm just gonna ask for every single one of us that we all just lift up this prayer together in support of those that raise their hands to receive Jesus. Say this, say, dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. I'm not perfect, but help me to live for you the best that I can. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Can we celebrate those that made first-time decisions today? Amen. Hey, friends, I, I always want to make it a point to say this, that it's, it's not a prayer alone that saves you. It's not a prayer alone that saves you. What a prayer does is it starts a relationship with Jesus. Right now we can walk with Jesus daily. Do you know what? That's why the church was invented, so you don't have to do life alone. We can do this thing together. None of us are perfect. We're all trying to pursue, however, this perfect risen Savior and become more like him. This is why church exists. And so uh, we'd love you to, uh, to, to walk through this new life with you for those that made first-time decisions. Uh, we meet every single Sunday here at 9, 11 a.m. Uh, and uh, we were just, we're so excited about what God's gonna do in your heart and life. Can we stand to our feet? We're gonna close in worship. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this message. We hope it was encouraging and impactful for you. We'd love it if you'd stay connected to us on our social media, My New Anthem Church on Instagram and Facebook, and also our website, mynewanthem.church. Now this message was our gift to you, and there's no obligation or any pressure for you to give, but if you are interested in investing in what our church is doing, we'd love for you to give online at mynewanthem.church. Hope you have a great rest of your week. We love you and God bless.